Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, I would just like to say on behalf of myself and my colleagues at Press Publica, uh, a big thank you for uh, having us for the Mesothelioma UK uh, Patient and Carer Day. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through uh, the campaign Airtight on Asbestos, which Press Publica has been running since uh, July of last year, uh, and tell you a little bit about myself before we move on. I'll be going through the objectives of this campaign, explaining exactly what it is that Airtight on Asbestos stands for and aims to achieve. And then I'll be moving on to the theme of this session, which is, of course, safe management of asbestos, where I'll be taking you through a short presentation we've lifted from a webinar, which we gave earlier uh, this year, on where we see uh, a systemic failure on the part of the health and safety executive and then tell you a little bit more about the campaign and the various uh, functions and uh, content that you can access on the website and ways to get in contact with us uh, if you are interested in supporting our aims. So my name is Jack Aldane. I've been working as the media campaigns manager for uh, this campaign for us publica since October of last year. Um, I've learned a lot in this journey so far about what asbestos is, the relationship that the UK has had to this material industrially, and the problems that we still have today with regards to its condition uh, in situ within uh, a vast swathe of our public estate. Um, particularly striking to me has been the number of schools and hospitals that contain this material. 80% of our schools in Britain, 94% of NHS trusts, and it's on this basis really that we have persisted as a campaign in trying to bring this to the attention of the public, but also drill down to the uh, issue of management and how we detect what we cannot see within these structures, which we feel is important and, and really essential to getting to the bottom of where the culpability lies and how we can eradicate the threat as much as possible. As you well know, asbestos was banned in 1999 and it's been a, a sort of a, an open secret on the part of the country for a long time that it still is with us. Um, but that has sort of led to a bit of an excuse on the part of institutions to basically leave it where it is and continually come out with the same line that so long as it isn't disturbed, it's safe. Now, the donor to this campaign, Mr. Charles Pickles, uh, who is an independent campaigner for uh, what you really could uh, we could term uh, social justice and and health justice in this country with regards to asbestos um, is somebody who has a lot of experience working with the material. He knows how dangerous it is. He knows how badly managed it can be. And it was he who brought it to our attention last year. And so I would just like to uh, you know to name check him at this stage to to say that he is really the guy who without whom we wouldn't have gotten started. So. Um, let me start then um, by taking you through our objectives. So a little bit about this campaign, you can see my screen here. So the campaign then um, deals with the following, that currently the UK's health and safety standards allow for asbestos to remain undisturbed and left in situ. The health and safety executive believes the risk is negligible if asbestos remains undamaged um, and is not uh, disturbed. But the UK's current air monitoring regime permits levels of airborne asbestos fibers, which are 10 times greater in volume than that which is currently acceptable in Germany and Holland and, Fr and France as well. The ultimate goal of this campaign is to reorder the health and safety executives parameters around this product so that they are that they are properly reviewed and amended to reflect the genuine risks to public safety. And so this would, at a minimum, bring the UK into regulatory alignment with the best practices already instilled in other European nations. So let me take you through our objectives. Our objectives are to review and revise the duty to manage in line with practice and evidence that has been um, that has emerged in the last two decades to ensure it remains fit for purpose, to ensure that the amphibole hypothesis, that amosite, in other words, and crocidolite present a significantly higher risk than other types of asbestos is acknowledged and accepted within the HSE's risk assessment algorithm, to amend HSE guidance, risk assessments, and priority assessment to take account of early exposure. For example, secondary schools and social housing present double the risk, primary schools quadruple the risk. Fourthly, to assure rather than assume, which is what we currently do, 
that buildings are safe through periodic sensitive, periodic sensitive air monitoring based upon revised risk priority assessments, which are in line with the best international practice as a minimum. It's worth noting here that there, are currently, there is currently no evidence of exposure because we are not looking for it. That is not to say that people are not being exposed. And as well, our objectives include to improve the regime for the reporting of disturbance to asbestos materials. AMAP, which was a, uh, an exercise rolled out in 2019, records no incidents of disturbance to asbestos in schools over five years. This is highly unlikely and therefore contestable. It suggests that asbestos exposure is not being adequately reported. And then to ensure that the reporting regime reflects the children, that children in particular are both at greater risk of harm due to exposure and liable to cause disturbance. And finally, to include domestic properties within the duty to manage where people work in houses that contain asbestos and to ensure that it is a requirement for homeowners to include an asbestos audit in their home, uh, home information when selling a property. So that's the full gamut of our, uh, our uh, objectives there. Um, and it's quite a lot to take in. And hence that's why I would encourage anybody who's uh, listening today this morning to uh, come to us and, and find out more. Uh, much of that though won't surprise you. I'm sure many of you are aware of the current management regime around asbestos, um, but this is where our focus lies. We want to basically change not just parts of the management regime, we want to change the very culture that allows for this persistent negligence to continue um, based on very little other than a sense that, you know, the worst is over. Those of traditional industries, your shipbuilders, uh, your textile workers, uh, with their industries now faded out, the risk of exposure has faded out as well. This is not the case. It's a silent killer. It remains very much at large and it is killing people of younger and younger generations um, in, in slow and steady progressive trends that we are seeing and that we have to do something about. It's not enough to say that asbestos is a problem that belongs to the past. It belongs very much to our present and it will be with us in our future if we don't act now. So let's look for a moment at the specific uh, problem of management, safe management of asbestos um, in the UK as compared to other parts of Europe and to drill down and see what it is that we mean when we say there is a problem and a solution that we could uh, very much attain in this country if we were simply to emulate models that are already uh, existent in other parts of the world. So the problem as we see it is something like this, that asbestos is the nation's number one occupational killer, causing more than 5,500 deaths a year compared to just 1,700 deaths in France. There are up to 6 million tons of asbestos across 1.5 million buildings in the UK. The current policy in relation to this increasingly aging and deteriorating material is confined to its management in situ. As a result, there is a worrying increase in death rates among non-traditional occupations, especially teachers and nurses, where deaths have been rising exponentially. Our contention is that the UK lags behind the regulatory practice of other countries, such as France, but also, as we mentioned earlier, Germany and the Netherlands, and that this is contributing to high death rates from unnecessary exposure to asbestos fibres. Air monitoring is an essential procedure for detecting levels of asbestos fibres within the atmosphere. It is a legal requirement when asbestos has been removed from a building or when asbestos has been disturbed and needs remediation. It ensures that a site is safe and clear of asbestos fibers and is a mandatory part of the site clearance certification process. However, air monitoring in the UK is not a routine activity and cannot provide assurance of a safe level for everyday use in buildings. So, Unlike France and Germany, the UK does not have a legislated environmental limit for the amount of airborne asbestos that can be permitted in a building at a safe level for everyday use. We aim to show, as we did in our webinar, 
uh, that the UK's uh, that the UK's regulatory framework does not have appropriate indicators for ambient exposure and uses an inferior method for microscopy. The ultimate goal is to reverse the risks at which li the lives of nurses, teachers, and school children are being placed every day. And so in sum, the UK's health and safety regime for the management of asbestos in situ needs urgent reform. Unlike France, we have a system that does not provide mandatory periodic monitoring. Air monitoring only occurs in the event of removal and remediation and cannot account for an environmental level of airborne asbestos or provide any level of assurance regarding the safety of the general public. We use an outdated form of microscopy that cannot detect or measure proven carcinogenic fibers in the air. And what's most peculiar about this is that the HSC is bound, lawfully bound, to adopt best practice under the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974. So the question really is, why have they refused to acknowledge the evidence from France? Uh, how do we succeed in making the HSC adopt the scientific evidence for other microscopy regimes and thereby improve the UK's current health and safety regime? So this presentation I've lifted from that webinar, which was entitled Air Today, Gone Tomorrow. It was presented uh, to uh, quite a large group of our stakeholders and members and also open to members of the general public uh, in July of this year. And you can find a uh, full recording of that webinar online. If you go to www.airtightonasbestos.uk slash blog, you'll see here we have a whole list um, of um, content that we've produced over the course of the last 12 months or so. And on the 27th of July, we had this webinar, which is filled out in terms of detail not just with the presentation that we gave, but with that which was given by a man called Hugo Perez. Hugo Perez is a business development manager for ITGA Group. Um, he's an expert on, in this field. He's particularly an expert in how France's regime works, how it's evolved over time. And he gave a fascinating presentation that shows the sheer contrast between the UK's model and the French model. You can download the slides from his presentation here. Below, you can see a full video of the conversation uh, we had, which takes place over an hour, um, which gives you the full context and tells you uh, even more uh, than I've been able to in this presentation about this issue. Uh, but so I strongly recommend that you, you, uh, you look at this. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a very productive, very revealing, and quite an alarming uh, webinar for all those who had come uh, not quite knowing what to expect. The speaker lineup, as you can see, and people who we have since managed to uh, bring on board as, um, as comrades in this fight are uh, Mr. Stephen Timms, MP. He's also chair of the Select Committee for Work and Pensions, David Morris, MP, uh, Hugo, who I just mentioned, Charles Bickles, who I mentioned earlier, our independent campaigner, and myself as moderator. So let's go back to the homepage here because I'd just like to end by giving you a little brief tour of, of all the evidence and content that we've managed to amass. Uh, our homepage lays out our uh, media coverage where you can see the uh, sort of places that we've been talking about this uh, over the last uh, 12 months. We've managed to appear on LBC Radio. We've had articles published in CapEx, The Guardian, The Times, The Mail Online. So we've had some success in getting the message out there, but we still haven't finished. It gives you context to what we've been up to, but still changes, uh, changes is desirable. So. We look at research now and we see that we have our flagship report and our various policy paper recommendations here. For example, why a national asbestos database can and should be established. Uh, phase removal, lessons from Europe, again drawing on other national examples. And our flagship report published and covered uh, in October of last year, Don't Breathe In, Bridging the Asbestos Safety Gap. I'd also like to draw your attention to our podcast. Um, there are four episodes to this. The fourth and final episode is due to be uh, uploaded later on this year. Much of this, again, won't come uh, as any uh, surprise or, or as news to you. The history of asbestos, um, the role it played in British industry, 
um, stories like that of Nellie Kershaw, which have been covered as historical cases of asbestos related illness. Um, but nonetheless, it takes you through an audio journey of uh, the story of this, of this material. And uh, it's one other way of engaging with this issue today other than reading. If you find time to uh, tear yourself away from your screen and you need to give your eyes a rest, I thoroughly recommend that. You can subscribe to it on Apple Podcast um, or Spotify or anywhere else. Um, and then finally, to give you uh, the option to get in touch, which we very much welcome, if you could send an email to asbestos at respublica.org.uk um, or email me personally at jackaldane at respublica.org.uk. Uh, you will be able to uh, find me very easily. I'll be more than happy to take any questions or direct you to uh, any of my colleagues who might be answer more, able to answer more specific questions on this. But nonetheless, um, it's been a pleasure to really tell you about ourselves, about what we're trying to do here. Ultimately, as I say, the goal is to try to get the HSC to recognize where it's been failing uh, over the last 20 years since the ban, to understand that the way that we monitor for airborne asbestos in the air is totally ins insufficient. We must have a, a model that at least achieves best practices as already used in uh, other countries in Europe. And until we do that, until we do that, we are going to have people in the public sector, those who, as we all know, over the last five months have uh, revealed themselves to be absolutely essential to society, dying prematurely because of exposure to a material which they half the time don't even know lurks in their place of work and which they're not being told about because the duty to manage is such a fragmented and badly defined role that the HSC is essentially getting away with the bare minimum. Um, and despite all cuts to the HSE's budget over the last 10 years, we're now at a point where I think we can expect to see those budgets being more directly plowed into areas where uh, they are most needed. We hope anyway, fingers crossed, but as we well know, that you don't always get um, what, you, what you can see to be the, the, the biggest need in society uh, just by hoping for it. So this is an absolutely essential problem. And, uh, and we, want to, we want to make a change here and now. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. And I'd just like to say again, thank you very much for listening this morning. And uh, I wish you all the very best for the rest of the day.